Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, good to have everybody back again. We've lost a few people, but I can't say that I blame them this afternoon. It's been a long session. But anyway, we're uh, again wanting to let our TV people know that we're just an informal Bible study, and I don't want it to be anything but that. I don't want to start preaching at people. We just want to teach the book, although I do get a little wound up. I know I do, but uh, I still don't want to get away from the teaching concept that people can see for themselves what the book says. It doesn't matter what some denomination says or what I say. What does the Word of God say? And we have to be able to rightly divide it, separate it, and then it all falls in place. All right. Program number four. We're in book 81. My, I just asked Iris coming up. That means how many trips to Tulsa? <laughs> That's been a bunch of them. And uh, anyway, it's gone fast. Now let's continue on that kin kingdom concept before we uh, go back and go any verse by verse with Daniel again. Let's come back to Matthew now, chapter 3, in the onset of Christ's earthly ministry, which is going to begin with John the Baptist. Because after all, John the Baptist was sent to be the herald or to announce the king and his kingdom to the nation of Israel, because all these covenant promises were made only to Israel. The Gentiles had no part of those covenants, but as we saw in the last part of the last program, <clears throat> Israel was to understand that even though all the covenant promises were theirs, they would still be instrumental in bringing in the Gentile to a knowledge of Israel's God. And of course, we've been seeing a little preview of that in our study of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. That process where he was a total pagan with no concept of the God of God, but as you come up through his life, he sees a little more and a little more until finally before I think he left planet Earth, he was a believer in the God of Israel, or the Most High. All right, so now remember that, that all these promises of this coming king were limited to the nation of Israel because he was to be their king. Well, what prompted, what prompted uh, the Romans to put above Christ on the cross, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? What prompted him? Well, he had that much understanding, even as a pagan ruler, that that's what he had claimed to be, that he had claimed to be the king of Israel. All right, now we come into Matthew chapter 3, and we start with John the Baptist. Verse 1, in those days, that is, after Jesus had now grown up in Nazareth as the carpenter's son, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea down there by the Jordan River. <clears throat> and what does he preach? Repent. Repent. Now, it's interesting. You know, I get chewed up one side and down the other because I maintain that repentance is not a prerequisite for salvation today. You know, we don't repent and then get saved. We get saved and then we repent. And uh, I got a fellow out in uh, Indiana, and he'll hear this just as well as you will and won't bother him a bit. He said, Les, when they asked me if I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, I said, no, I never accepted him as my personal Savior. He says, I believed the gospel. But he said, the moment I believed the gospel, he became my personal savior. <laughs> hey, I like that. Or use the other one that they all like to use. Take Jesus into your heart. No, that's not the gospel. It's not in this book. What's in this book is that if you believe that Jesus died, shed his blood, was buried, and rose from the dead, thou shalt be saved, and you believe that, then what's the first thing you do? You change your mind about things. You repent. And what does God do? He comes into your life. The Holy Spirit comes in. See, so don't get that cart out there in front of the horse like most of Christendom does. Leave it where it belongs. Salvation comes first. But for Israel, 
Yes, repentance was a prerequisite. See, and that's what we got to understand, the change in program. All right, so that's what made me think of it. In the days that John the Baptist came preaching, repent. Now for Israel, see, that was a logical word because did Israel know the right from wrong? Of course they did. They had the book. They had the Old Testament ever since day one. They knew and if they didn't, it was their own fault. And so they had to look at their own situation as a nation as well as individuals and change their mind about these things in order for God to bless them with the king and the kingdom. So yes, for Israel, a prerequisite was to repent. For us, it's a result. What a difference. All right, so now John the Baptist says, repent for what reason? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because the king is in their midst. The king is in there. He's already walking the dusty road, see? And then he goes on to say, like one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, see? And so here is the first inkling now that the king is on the planet, he's in the midst of Israel, and he's ready to prepare Israel for the kingdom. Well, of course, now I guess the next place I should stop would be in Peter's confession of faith in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Now, a lot of this I know we've covered over and over, but repetition is still the key. And now in Matthew 16, we're at the end of Christ's three years of his earthly ministry. He's been performing miracle after miracle after miracle. Did it, did all those miracles, did they convert the nation of Israel? No. 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 Just a few. So you see, that's not the key. That is not the key. Miracles do not bring people to salvation. Even the miracles of Christ himself, see? And so now after three years of miracle after miracle after miracle, the supernatural was just an everyday occurrence. He has the 12, and they're up clear at the headwaters of the Jordan River in uh, what we call Caesarea Philippi, and the Roman word is Benias. In fact, we were just there last October. It's beautiful. They've made a national park out of it. And Jesus... Verse 13, came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, the twelve, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, now watch this. We've gone over it before, but look at it again. They responded by saying, Well, they think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Others think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he saith unto them, Whom do you say that I am? Fellows, you've been with me now for three years. Who am I? That's all he's asking. Who am I? And now G, uh, Peter responds. Verse 16. That's what I call Peter's confession of saving faith. And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. See? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Any reference to the cross? Any reference to his death? Not a word. And he was right on. That's all God expected him to say. Because that was the crux of the matter. Who am I? Well, you're the promised Messiah. Well, see, if every Jew would have answered that way, as we saw back there in Acts chapter 3 earlier this afternoon, Christ would have come. They would have fulfilled. In fact, I had a question in the mail yesterday, and it's a good question, and I, I, I hope you've all been aware of that. If, if, it's a big if, if a human being could keep the Ten Commandments without ever breaking a one of them, could he get to heaven on it? Well, yes, because he hasn't broken them. But what's the problem? It's not possible. <laughs> See, only Christ did. No human being can go through life without breaking the law. It's impossible. But if, if they could, 
then there would be nothing to keep them out of God's heaven. They're sinless. They're pure, see? But we're not. We're hell-bound sinners. All right? But here was Peter's confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. See? All right, now then as you come on through the crucifixion and all that, and uh, we're not going to pick that up here because we want to look first at Israel's relationship to this kingdom. Now come over with me to Luke chapter 1. Because I want you to see what Israel was to have believed as a nation of people. They were to believe it to the last Jew. Luke chapter 1. And let's just drop in at verse 67. Here we have Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, approached as to what the young lad's name should be. And he said his name is John. All right. Now then, verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the key. Don't miss that word, filled. He had all of the Holy Spirit that a man could have so that he could thoroughly understand all that is facing the nation of Israel. Don't miss that. And his he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke forth, being moved by the Holy Spirit. And look what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of whom? Israel. Israel. Not a word about the Gentile world. Israel. See, and this is what we have to understand, and what most of Christendom still doesn't understand. That everything Jesus said and did up until the cross was on behalf of these Old Testament covenants made with Israel. Not a thing about the Gentiles. All right? For he hath visited and redeemed his people. He hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of of his servant David. How many Gentiles in the house of David? Not a one. Not a one. This is all strictly Jewish ground. Now verse 70. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, as we've been looking at all afternoon, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses, see? As he spoke through all the holy prophets, which have been since the ages began, that we, the nation of Israel, that we should be saved from our sins. Come on. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. Saved from their what? Their enemies. Well, now stop and think. Who were Israel's enemies, you might say, from the very onset of Abraham, but especially by the time of Christ? Well, the Arab world around them. No different than today. It's always been that same being circumvented by the Arab world, see? All right, but when this promised king and kingdom would come in, they wouldn't have a thing to do with them, see? Now then, that we should be saved, Marianis, from the hand of all that hate us. Now, I hope you realize that anti-Semitism is coming up day by day again. We're just about back like it was when Hitler showed up. And all that hate us, verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and David, and all the rest. The oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him, that is, the king, that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. In other words, it's going to be heaven on earth, a kingdom of righteousness, absent wickedness, see? And then verse 76, he now comes with regard to the announcement of the king, the Messiah, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people. See? 
All Jewish promises. All right, now then, let's jump over to the book of Acts and come over to the scenario after his 40 days of being with the 12, after his resurrection. Now, Easter Sunday's coming up. Oh, oh I'm dating the program, aren't I? <laughs> but uh, Easter. And for just a few hours, at least a portion of the world's population will be made aware of resurrection morning. But, like we were talking on a phone yesterday, he agreed with me 100%. I said, you know, there are multitudes of people that believe that Jesus died, was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose miraculously from the dead. But they only know it historically. And what do I mean by that? They don't have it in the heart. It's just a historical fact. Now, do any of you doubt that Washington crossed the Delaware on that cold, miserable winter day? No, you don't doubt that. Why? Because history has reported it over and over. And so we can all talk about it. Well, it's the same way with the rank and file of the world. Yeah, they know that there was this Jesus who was crucified and the Romans and all this. And he arose from the dead. But it's just a historical bit of information. It doesn't mean anything to them spiritually. Always remember that. That even though we see all the services of Christmas and all the services of, of Easter, for the rank and file, even of most church members, that's all it is. It's just a mental ascent to a historical record. But to bring it into a means of salvation, I'm afraid it's for the precious few. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. All right, but now we come back to Acts chapter 1. And he's been resurrected, and he's been with the eleven for 40 days. Now drop down to chapter 1, verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, his death, burial, and resurrection. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And you know, it has happened over and over where a skeptic or an atheist will just actually rant and rave that there was never such a thing as a resurrection and they go to the Middle East to prove that they're right and what happens? They become a believer. They become a believer, see? And it happens over and over when there is so much evidence that indeed he arose from the dead. All right, so these... Days were spent then speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now that throws a curve at people because Matthew speaks all the time of the kingdom of heaven. And now here we have the kingdom of God. Now what's the difference? Paul even speaks of promoting the kingdom of God. Well, I put it on the board, I suppose, what, two, three years ago now. I've had Sharon, she's not here today, but uh, I had Sharon put a big circle. And then in the circle, I had her draw two smaller ones. Remember that? All right, the big circle is the kingdom of God. And that includes everything that pertains to God's holiness and righteousness. Heaven, the angels, the Old Testament believers, the New Testament believers. Everything that pertains to his holiness and his righteousness is in the big circle, the kingdom of God. So when Paul speaks of the kingdom of God, yes, we too are part of the kingdom of God. But those two circles that I had her put in the big circle, one was the kingdom of heaven. Well, since Israel rejected it, that's pretty much empty. But now what's the other circle? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. And that's all Paul talks about, with one or two exceptions, he calls it the kingdom. But the body of Christ is that compilation of believers now in this age of grace who have come into the body by virtue of believing the gospel. And we become members of the body. But we're in the kingdom of God. See that? Now, when the body of Christ is taken out, It'll still be part of the kingdom of God because heaven is. 
But now the kingdom of heaven becomes the major component because now Israel comes back into God's economy and Israel will once again be in the limelight and they will fill in the kingdom of heaven which is in the kingdom of God. Now does that make sense? I hope it does. When don't get confused. The kingdom of God is that overall everything that belongs to God. But in it you have the kingdom of heaven, which will become a reality when the thousand years begin. You've got the body of Christ, which we trust is nearly full. It'll be taken out and taken up into the heavens, but we're still part of the kingdom of God. So when Acts speaks here pertaining to the kingdom of God, yes, because the kingdom of heaven that Jesus has been proclaiming to be the king of is in the large circle. All right, now then verse 4. Being assembled together <clears throat> with the eleven, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but they were to wait for the promise of the Father, going back to John 17. What was the promise? That God would send the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will send a paraclete, someone to come alongside and be your help. All right, that's what he's referring to here. See, that when Jesus promised that when he would leave, the Holy Spirit would come. All right, so he says, Wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you, speaking through the eleven, but to the nation of Israel as a whole, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. How many? Ten days. Ten days. And what day will that be? Pentecost. See? Pentecost. And what happened? The Holy Spirit came down. All right, but we'll look at that later in another time. Now then, verse 6. So when they were come together, Jesus and these eleven apostles, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the what? The kingdom. See, it's all on their mind. It's all they've been hearing for three years. Well, now, Lord, are you ready to bring in the kingdom and give it to Israel? What was his answer? Oh, you foolish Galileans. No. He just says it's not for you to know when. Yes, the kingdom is coming, but it's not for you to know when. All right, now, lest you wonder, why are they at this late date now, after the Messiah has been crucified, he's been buried, he's been risen from the dead, He's been with them now for 40 days, showing his hands and in a physical body, ate fish, walked with them, talked with them. Why are they so expectant of the kingdom? Well, come back with me to Matthew. Matthew 19. Yeah, Matthew 19. I haven't looked at this in a long time. And this is toward the end of his earthly ministry. Verse 27, honey. Matthew 19, verse 27. Now don't forget why I brought you back here. Why is Peter and the rest of the fellows so anxious about this kingdom? Well, look what they got promised. See, everything fits. That's why I love to teach, to show how it all fits. Matthew 19, verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, that is unto Jesus, <clears throat> Behold, we have forsaken all. What's he talking about? His family, his fishing, Galilee. See, beautiful up there. I can see why they would hate to leave Galilee. All right, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What? shall we have therefore. What's Peter asking? What's going to be our reward? He knew he was saved. That wasn't the point. What are we going to have for reward? Lord, look what we left. Look what we did to follow you these last three years. What are you going to give us? Well, you know what that shows me? That those men were just as human as we are. 
That's all it is. It's our humanity. Hey, if I'm going to do all this, what do I get in return? Now look at the Lord's answer. He doesn't rebuke Peter. Not one bit. But he says, Verily, I say unto you, that you who have followed me these last three years, in the regeneration, in other words, when the thousand-year kingdom comes in, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Now, aren't you glad we've been looking at it all afternoon? Where is it going to be? Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The same place that David's throne sat. Now Jesus said, when I set up this kingdom and my throne room there in Jerusalem, you also, you 12 men, I won't be Judas, it'll be Matthias, but it'll be the 12 apostles, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. Now do you have to be a PhD to understand that? No. So when the king sets up his kingdom and he's going to rule the whole planet, who is primarily going to be in control of Israel? Well, the 12 apostles. Now, I don't know if I got room on the board or if I've got time. Oh, I haven't got time. But I drew a map in one of my classes the other night. Do you realize how huge the nation of Israel will be in the kingdom? It's not going to be that little slip of land along the Mediterranean. It's going to be the whole Middle East. See? I got time. Turn real quick. Turn real quick to Genesis chapter 15. Because when these men are going to be ruling the 12 tribes of Israel, they're going to be ruling a big portion of real estate. Genesis 15. And this is when God first first deeded it to the nation of Israel. It's a real estate transaction. All right, verse 18 of Genesis 15. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, and he said, Unto thy seed, that is, the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel, I have given, past tense, this land, now look where it goes, from the river of Egypt, whether it's the Nile or another one that might have been there, but figuratively speaking, from the Nile, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Oh goodness, you all know the Middle East well enough now. From the Nile to the Euphrates, and then in Joshua, it includes Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran. It's going to be the whole Middle East. It's going to be Israel's homeland. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.